Right next to me are uh, Daniel Crowley and Damon Smith. Um, they are both, both security engineers for the NCC group, and they told me they could not bring a, a unicorn today. Very sorry. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to um, tell us about um, some special properties in regular files. So, exciting, I think. Do your best. Thank Thanks. you. I think you're on. Hello. Hi, great. Microphone, volume, love it. So, as uh, previously stated, um, we're here to tell you about bugged files. So, let's uh, start out with a, a quick introduction. Hi, my name is Damon Smith. Um, as mentioned, I'm a security engineer working with NCC Group. Um, traditionally, my focus has been application security, including web applications, embedded devices, uh, mobile applications. Um, more recently, I've started doing some um, research on file formats with this lovely gentleman right here. Um, so I mostly work, I, I, I'm also a security engineer with NCC Group, and uh, I, mo I mostly like working with web applications, crypto, um, some uh, embedded stuff, and uh, file formats. So. Let's, uh, let's move on. So just to, um, to clarify a little bit, this, this talk is, uh, is focused in a particular way. Um, we're going to be talking about files that trigger outbound traffic when they're opened. Um, we didn't want to look at executable formats because it's not really interesting for me to tell you that an executable can make outbound traffic when you open it because there's a lot of other nasty things that it can do, of course. Um, we didn't really uh, try to limit it to complex formats or simple formats or anything like that. We were taking a look at what we believe are very common formats. Um, so um, we also didn't want to use any exploits. We didn't want to find bugs in file parsers. We wanted to uh, use only the features of the parsers and the formats that they're parsing. Um, and we also want to discuss the implications of all this. So why should you listen to us talk at you for the next 50 minutes? We think that the research that we've done is very important for a variety of different reasons. The first and most obvious reason are the privacy implications. Um, imagine, we're, we're going to go over some of these use cases in a little bit more detail, but for now, imagine documents that can phone home every time you interact with them. This can be used in DRM, data loss prevention, and of course, de-anonymizing users. In addition to the um, privacy aspect, there is also some serious security concerns with these types of file formats, which we'll go into a little bit later. Finally, and I think most importantly, um, all of the things that we're going to show you today are not bugs. They're not a mistake that a programmer made. They're not off by one errors. They're not memory corruption. These are things that were written into the RFC. They are in the file format specification, and they are working as intended. This is not something that's going to be fixed on Patch Tuesday. These bugs are going to live for years. So um, we're going to start with a quick demonstration with three different formats, RTF, SVG, and WMV. A quick prayer to the demo gods, please. So here I've got, uh, I've got Metasploit open um, just for the SMB capture. Um, so uh, we've got this. Can everyone see that OK? Yes? Excellent. So we've got this uh, providing the standard challenge and dumping to a file. Um, and over here we have our victim machine uh, with several of our bug documents. And this so, is running Windows 8.1 fully patched. Yes. So we're going to open up this RTF file. Now, um, something interesting happens here. Um, when we open this, uh, you can see in a moment it's going to pop up a little uh, dialog that says, uh, this document contains one or more links to other files. Do you want to update this document with the data from the linked files? Uh, what's really interesting about this is that it has already sent the hashes along. <laughs> so Worst warning message ever, right? Yeah. Um, I think probably they're looking for, uh, they, they're looking to prevent bugs with, the, um, you know, the document attacking some parser, but um, even if we say no, it doesn't matter because the hashes have already been sent. You know, cat's out of the bag. So, um, just, so there's nothing up my sleeve here. I'm going to clear, clear this. 
and uh, we'll open up this SVG file. By default on Windows, SVG files are parsed by Internet Explorer. Yeah. So um, there's a bunch of fun things that you can do with Internet Explorer regarding this, and if we have time, we'll discuss that a little bit. Um, but here you see um, an, an image format, um, of all things, can, can cause this interaction to occur. Yeah. So our example SVG file is blank, but you could easily have whatever arbitrary image that you want show up so that people don't get suspicious. Absolutely. So um, what I'm going to do now, um, we've kind of set this up to knock it out of the park. Um, it's not always going to be this easy. But um, in this case, since we, it was not quite so easy to set up a demo for NTLM relaying, which would be mostly what I think would be useful, um, we're going to go ahead and just crack the hashes that we've received. And uh, here we see that we've got a throwaway account with the password of throwaway. So uh, like I said, we, we set this one up for ourselves. But um, we, we now, just because somebody opened up a document that is you know, not malformed, it's like a well-formed example of a format that's using its features, you know, everything is working as normal, but this is normal. So this is by design, are. people. This is how it is supposed to work. So, um, it's just a lot of things that, when put together, don't work the way we really want them to. So um, the last thing that I want to show you here um, is a Windows Media video file. This is a slightly modified version of a video that comes with Windows by default. Um, as it turns out, um, you can actually cause uh, interactions to occur from a video. Uh, this is, again, this is part of the format, and we will be discussing this later on. But we've just had it launch a, a browser window. Um, so that's lovely. Um, so that concludes the demonstration. And we're going to start talking about you know, all the different formats that we have, uh, that we've got things on, and um, sort of the implications and, and whatnot. So um, continuing on from the demo, um, I probably should have hit play from current slide and not play from start. So. <laughs> So there's been some prior work in this area. And Damon, would, would, do you want me to take this one? So there's been some prior work in this area. Um, this is not really a new technique. We're not pioneering this whole, hey, let's send NTLM, uh, in, uh, let's send SMB and get NTLM hashes. Um, this is something that's been known for a while. There's a, a tool out there called Zack Attack, which uh, implements many of the ones that you see here. Um, there's also a, a tool in Metasploit that's been around since 2008. But, um, but this problem still exists. And um, we kind of wanted to see like, how, how widespread is this. Um, so it's already known that you can do this with the Office formats, the Office Open XML, which is not confusing at all um, when compared to the Open Office XML format, which is a, a, from a different, anyway. The Microsoft XML-based document formats, um, there are ways to do with this. Um, PLS playlists, uh, shortcut files, I can read it to you, but I think you guys can read. Um, some other silly things. Um, in Internet Explorer, um, HTML elements can reference SMB paths and cause this interaction to happen. Uh, so for instance, in, uh, in Windows Media Player, you saw that we were able to pop open a browser window using Windows Media, uh, a Windows Media video file. Um, we can load that up to a URL, which then has an image on an SMB resource and triggers that same NTLM interaction. Um, the same thing can be done in HTML emails in Outlook. So um, that's a little bit of the prior art in the area. What did our research focus on? So we focused on three families of formats, um, document formats, media formats, and groupware formats, or meeting and scheduling formats. We wanted to look at file formats that your traditional corporate employee on your traditional corporate build is likely to open. For instance, PDF files. That's something that your average corporate employee is used to receiving in their email on a daily basis and will blindly double click them without any thought. So that's the, that defines which file formats we specifically looked at. So um, one of the most obvious ones was PDF. Um, this was immediately something that we wanted to take a look at. It's a very complex format. We knew there was going to be something in there somewhere. And uh, they're incredibly common, PDF files. Um, so we spent a little time on this. Um, you can embed remote images in PDFs, as it turns out. Um, so 
this will just automatically go and fetch the image when opened. Um, one of the interesting things is that, um, so uh, as a note, these only work on Adobe Reader. Um, most of the PDF readers out there uh, have a very limited subset of the PDF functionality available. So um, Firefox, Chrome, um, Preview from Mac OS, all of these uh, support a, a limited subset of PDF functionality, and these techniques don't work on them, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on who you are. So the remote image functionality, um, that basically just grabs an image from a remote endpoint and displays it within the PDF. Um, and of course, you have to reach out to a third party to get that, and if you're creating the PDF document, you're choosing who you connect to. Um, there's also uh, JavaScript functionality in PDFs, which is, you know, what could go wrong. But um, there is a method that allows you to open a, uh, a video player within a PDF, which is... is Insane. Uh, I can't imagine why you would ever want to do that. I, I can imagine why you might want to, but I might, you know, need substances first. But... Regardless, I just, you know, maybe I'm just not thinking of PDF in the way that other people are thinking of PDF. Regardless, you can open up a video uh, from a third party location um, and the same, and there's also a, a method that allows you to uh, just pop open a URL in the browser, um, in the default browser, that is, which is get URL. Um, and this, you might be looking at this, uh, this warning message and wondering, what's going on here, and I'll, I'll leave it to Damon to explain the, the nitty-gritty details behind that. So as we mentioned, it is possible to open um, SMB paths within the JavaScript parsing engine of PDF readers. Unfortunately, it does issue a warning message. However, when we were investigating this particular bug, we found an interesting aspect to this warning message. Um, many of you are probably already familiar with UNC pass, which is something like slash slash host name slash share name slash file. There is an additional form of UNC that you may not be familiar with called long form UNC. That goes slash slash question mark slash host name slash share name slash file. I don't really know why that exists, but as you can see from this warning message, we actually confused the PDF reader into thinking that the question mark was the host name. So we can cause you to connect to www.sketchyattackerwebsite.com, but your PDF reader will instead say, this document is trying to connect to, huh? Do you want to allow this? I'm not sure if that's more or less sketchy than saying www.attacker.com, but you know, it's, a, it's a neat nuance of this particular format, so have fun with it. We thought it was funny enough to include, regardless of whether it's actually useful to anybody. So the next format that we have, and one that you've already seen a demonstration of, is the rich text format. The very cool thing about the demo that you saw earlier and the proof of concept is that it works in both WordPad and Microsoft Office. So it doesn't matter if your victim has the Microsoft Office suite installed or not, if they double click this RTF file, you will get their NTLM credentials. Additionally, as you saw during the demonstration, it does put up a little warning message about linked files and do you want to display them, but it only displays that warning message after it has already sent your credentials to the attacker, making it possibly the most useful, u sorry, useless warning message ever. So uh, you also saw the, uh, uh, I think, that actually, you should talk about So the other thing that we've already demonstrated is SVG, which stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. Um, it is an image file format, but it is for displaying vector images instead of the traditional image formats, which are used for bitnet images. Very quickly, the difference between bitmap and vector graphics is bitmap roughly is a data structure that defines this pixel has this color, and this transparency and all that, and then it describes the next pixel and the next pixel and the next pixel until it has built the entire image. With vector graphics, it describes the image in terms of vector functions. So it says, draw this line from here to here with this color. So it's two different ways of encoding an image file. Uh, and SVG, as we mentioned during the live demonstration, by default on Windows is parsed with Internet Explorer. The fun thing about SVG is the way that it's structured. It is a markup language very similar to HTML, and it actually implements a subset of the HTML language um, as part of the SVG format. One of the things that you're allowed to specify in an SVG file are remote XML style sheets. So I can say, load this cascading style sheet from this remote location, and if you're using Internet Explorer, which by default on Windows you are, uh, it will accept file paths. So you can say, for this image file, I want you to download the style sheet from this remote SMB share, which, of course, as you saw during the demonstration, leads to disclosure of NTLM credentials. 
Additionally, they can run JavaScript. Did you know your images could have JavaScript in them? No, because that's insane. So we took a look at uh, various playlist formats. Um, as stated earlier in the talk, PLS is prior art. That was not our uh, discovery. Um, but we found out that uh, both M3U, um, which is closely tied to the M uh, MP3 format, and uh, ASX, which is more of a Windows Media specific playlist format, um, both of those are also susceptible to this sort of uh, tomfoolery. Um, so basically, all of these playlist formats support for, you know, uh, reasons of internet radio and that sort of thing, remote paths. So obviously there's the, uh, the ability to make remote references. Interestingly, um, and it, now I think it's probably the right time to bring up uh, that Windows is where UNC paths are handled in general. Um, the same API call that is used to open a file from the local file system is the API, it's the same API used to open UNC paths. It just sort of, at some point during the, the, the function call, uh, sees, oh, this is, this is actually a UNC path. Let me handle this remotely, you know, this like remote interaction. So um, you don't necessarily need to write UN, like SMB, UNC, whatever handling into your parser. You just have to like use the standard way of interacting with the file system in your parser, and Windows will make make this happen for you. So um, most of these playlist formats are just um, it, they're as simple in, in in the case of M3U at least um, as a list of items, a list of paths. Uh, to be played. So in all of these formats, instead of specifying a file path, you can specify a UNC path, and it will do the interaction, sort of interaction that you saw previously. Or if you just want to see when somebody opens up your playlist, you can embed a remote reference at the start. So the next format that we looked at is actually a family of formats, the ASF family of formats, which you are probably more familiar with as Windows Media Video and Windows Media Audio. Um, this one was actually really interesting to us because who thought that your audio and video files could contain remote tracking code? So this was actually a kind of surprising result. It comes courtesy of a friend of ours, um, Derek Hinch, Black Days. So shout out to him for introducing us to this technique. The way that this is accomplished is by embedding script metadata into an WMV or WMA file. You have the ability to embed scripts in these video and audio files such that when playback reaches a specified point, for instance, five seconds in, it will execute the contents of this script command. This has traditionally been used to accomplish things like closed captioning. So you can have it display text on the screen when you reach the 30 second mark that corresponds to whatever the people on screen are saying at 30 seconds. That's more or less how closed captioning is implemented in this format. However, when you're looking at these script commands, in addition to doing something like display text on screen, you also have this really cool one called URL and exit, which means open this specified URL in the default browser and halt playback. As you saw during the demonstration, this equates to you are watching a video file that you, you know, whatever video file, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speculate on what kind of video it is. That's up to you. But anyway, so you get to the 30 second mark. That's when the video starts to become really interesting and bam, it opens up your browser window to www.nsa.gov slash you've been tracked, la la la. So that's, that's what we're running into with these file formats. Yes, your video files can contain embedded script commands and yes, those script commands can de-anonymize you, which is really unfortunate. Um, additionally, a, the um, a technique that we've postulated but have not yet proven is abusing the built-in DRM functionality. So to briefly describe how DRM works in this family of formats, um, it's actually quite simple. It encrypts the entire video file, and then in the header information, it specifies if you want to watch this video file, you need to go to this URL and download the decryption key. That's more or less at, at a high level how DRM is implemented in these formats. It's fairly obvious that this can be used to track people. Unfortunately, this is something that we haven't yet demonstrated because the DRM is so horrible to work with that we can't even get it working legitimately, much less circumvent it. But look for that in the future. That's probably a technique that either has been used by your adversaries or will be in the future. Um, additionally, one quick note, subtitles. They can include arbitrary HTML, not just bold or italics or underline like you might expect in a subtitle, but they can include things like image source equals. So you can actually have subtitles in a video file that reference a remote image. I don't know why that's the case, but that can also be used for tracking.
So uh, the next format that uh, we took a look at was MP3. And this one was obviously very interesting to us. Um, you know, obviously there are a number of entities that are looking to crack down on piracy. Um, so this was definitely an interesting one for us. Uh, the thing is that MP3 is actually a rather um, simple format in comparison to some other formats. Um, MP3 by itself doesn't actually include any metadata whatsoever. Um, and this might seem confusing to you because, you know, obviously MP3s that you might uh, legitimately acquire um, have uh, metadata in them describing the artist, the album, and all that sort of thing. And as it turns out, that's actually a separate format called ID3, which is just sort of de facto part of MP3 now. So since MP3 is basically just a series of fixed length blocks that say, here's how you're going to interpret this block of data as audio, next, you know, coming up, and then the, the, the block of audio data and repeat that until the end of the file. Um, ID3 was the obvious choice for going after this. Um, one of the things that we learned while doing this is that uh, people don't always follow the RFCs when creating something that is working with whatever technology you're defining. Um, there's a, there, the, so ID3 is, a, um, the way it's structured is as a series of frames, right? Um, so you have sort of like, here's the type of frame, and here's the length, and then here's the frame data, right? So there were two that were interesting to us, the link frame and the APEC frame. Link frame basically says, the frame you're looking for is in another castle, um, so, you know, go off and, and fetch this frame from this other file here. So I was like, yes, that's what I want. Um, and then there's also the APIC frame, which is attached picture. So you can say, uh, this picture is not here, it's in another place, go fetch it. Um, so the thing is, no player that we looked at, and we looked at a lot of them, support either of these types of frames. Um, however, when we found out that you could do the, the scripting content in WMA files, uh, as it turns out, you can just rename a WMA file to .mp3, and as long as it opens with Windows Media Player, it will be like, oh, 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 this is, this is named wrong. Here, I, I'll open this as a WMA file. Oh, oh, you want me to open a URL? Yeah, sure. So, um, so it's kind of cheating, but if it's stupid and it works, it ain't stupid. So there you are. Um, you might be wondering why there's a picture of a fish on this slide. Um, there's some hilarity in the ID3 RFC. Uh, as it turns out, um, as a part of the APIC frame, you specify what type of picture is attached. Um, number 13 is a bright colored fish, for whatever reason. <laughs> fun, another fun fact, Primus has its own innumerable like genre number in ID3. So, um, go Primus, I guess. So uh, we also took a look at the torrent format. Um, again, you know, uh, lots of entities looking to de-anonymize uh, pirates. Uh, and torrenting, for whatever reason, they, you know, has, has some ties with that. Um, so this one is actually pretty easy because you can have as many trackers as you want on uh, listed in, within a torrent. And when you open up the torrent, it's going to check all of those trackers until it gets you know, a certain number that are actually active. So it's just going to visit URL after URL after URL, and so you can get it to reach out to however many different places you want. Um, and since people tend to open up torrents and then just kind of leave them going for a while, the fact that it takes a long time to step through doesn't really make that big of a difference. The other thing that we saw that wasn't really implemented in any torrent client we noticed, uh, that, that we tried, was uh, URL seeds. So this was pitched as an alternative to the classic BitTorrent protocol seed. Uh, you can have HTTP seeds, you can have FTP seeds, which, uh, you know, if you have nothing in the swarm, if you have no active seeds, this is a way that you can get the data initially, right? But we didn't find anything that supports this. Um, so we weren't able to do, you know, FTP or any other funky URI handler. We were hoping for file because, again, we could get the NTLM win, but that's not something we got. Um, however, um, I can do something like initiate a whole bunch of U, uh, HTTP requests from wherever you're opening the file. So if I want to try to exploit, let's say, every CSERF flaw in home routers for the past 
five, 10 years using a torrent file, I can do that. So that's interesting. So the next one that we got to win on is the V card format. This is using for exchanging virtual business cards between users of, for example, um, Outlook, which is part of the Microsoft Office suite. So the V card format is used for exchanging of business cards, like I mentioned. It has a lot of the obvious fields, such as what is the person's name? What is the person's email address? What is their phone number? All that stuff that you would expect. It also has some things that you might not expect, at least not at first. One of the attributes that it supports that we found very useful is the free busy URL. Let me briefly describe what this is used for. So let's say that I've exchanged my virtual business card with Dan, and Dan would like to set up a meeting with me. When Dan opens up his calendar client and says, I want to schedule a meeting with Damon Smith, his calendaring agent will automatically go to my free busy URL and say, OK, is Damon Smith busy at 3 o'clock? Is Damon Smith busy at 4 o'clock, et cetera, et cetera. That is the proper functionality of the free busy URL. Um, that's obviously, that's, that's able to track people over HTTP. What is perhaps not so obvious, and I still don't understand why it's implemented this way, you can include a UNC path as a free busy URL. So I'm telling Dan's calendaring agent, if you want to find out when I'm free, you need to connect to this remote SMB share and download it from there, which is completely insane. And I can't imagine why this is allowed in the parser, but it's definitely allowed. And it definitely allows you to steal NTLM credentials. Yeah, I mean, I can't a, even explain it away like, oh, well, it's OK. You, you have local file paths that specify when somebody else is free or busy. Yeah, it, it, doesn't, you know, make it doesn't make any make sense. It. Like, it's kind of a, but, um, it's, it does take a little bit of social, social engineering or pretexting to get this to work. Not only do you have to get the victim to accept the virtual card and add it to their address book, you then have to convince them to attempt to schedule a meeting with you. So it's perhaps not the easiest to exploit, but if you've got some skills at social engineering, which I'm sure some in the crowd do, you could probably pull it off. So the next one we looked at, um, we included this for posterity and for uh, hilarity. Um, because ICS is kind of a fun read if you take a look at the RFC. Um, well, I guess if you like reading RFCs, so I so guess I'm maybe a quick a anecdote. Weird. If you're ever writing a file parser, there are actually three critical steps that you have to follow. Step one is to read the entire RFC for whatever file format you're designing for. Step two is to take the RFC and light it on fire. And step three is to do whatever the hell you want and completely ignore the RFC. Uh, truth. Real talk. So, um, so the way in which this, this manifests for ICS, um, there's a particular line of, uh, ICS files are actually very easy to read. If you just pop one open, you start immediately understanding sort of how the file is structured. Um, it's one of those great file formats that you can just kind of understand intuitively by looking at it, which is great. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things is vAlarm, which defines the alarm uh, that is associated with a given meeting request or calendar event. So um, one interesting thing about this is that this is actually defined by the meeting request sender, not the receiver. Um, so, and you can have multiple alarms. So um, one thing that you can do, which is really hilarious, is to set up a meeting with somebody in two days and set off an alarm to pop up a pop-up box and you know play a sound every minute until then. Um, so, depending on your, your calendar user agent, it might automatically accept the meeting invite as well, which is hilarious. So, um... Denial of sleep attack. Yeah. So, um, so I start reading, so I'm reading this RFC, it's late, I've probably had something to drink, I've almost certainly had something to drink. And, um... I'm looking at this and I'm looking through the different types of alarms. There's four. There's uh, two, you know, perfectly reasonable ones. There's one that's like oh, oh, display, pop up a pop up box, uh, alarm, like make some sound, whatever, I don't care. Audio, which is like, oh, go to this URL, download this sound and play that. And I'm like, ooh, that, that could be nice. And then the fourth one, I'm just like, you know, it's, it's like a spit take moment. It's like, oh, just, it's called procedure, just run this command with these parameters. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> so here is the heartbreaking thing, or the really relieving thing, depending on who you are. It doesn't work in any calendar user agent that we looked at. Doesn't work in any of them. I'm just imagining somebody implementing it and like looking at the RFC like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's the light the RFC on fire moment right there. 
So not even uh, the successor, because this is the iCalendar format. Not even the successor to iCalendar supports this. Uh, it, I mean, it does, but you have to define the meeting yourself. Um, I got a little bit excited when I created something that used a procedure alarm, uh, because it pops up this box that's like, do you want to accept this? And the options, instead of being like yes or no, are like no, and no, you know what, don't even import this at all. So I'm like, <laughs> yes, they'll click through. <laughs> No or no harder. Yeah, no, yeah, no or more no. So um, unfortunately, this is not a usable technique, but it's just, it's a funny thing, and I can't believe that this was an idea that somebody had and like wrote it down and shared it because I just, uh, it, 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 I just, I don't even understand. But um, there you have it. So All let's right. start talking about um, potential use or misuse. So we've discussed the formats that make this possible. Now let's discuss a little bit about why anyone would care. Why would anyone want to abuse this functionality? The first and perhaps the most obvious implication that we could think of is digital rights management. One of our favorite words at Chaos Camp, am I right? We all love DRM. Imagine a dystopian future DRM that every time a particular file is open, calls home to a remote server to track that that file has been opened. This goes beyond traditional DRM, whose sole purpose is to dissuade you from opening a file when you don't have the right to open it. This goes beyond that and goes into identifying the people that are attempting to open these files. This is a lot more dangerous than the DRM that we have today, and this is something that can be done today in today's file parsers. This is something we haven't seen it done but it's, it's something that I think we should all be a little bit afraid of. To be fair, we haven't looked very hard to see if this is being done. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt on all of you. <laughs> so um, there's also the sort of a, a data loss prevention angle to this. And there's, there's, two, there's sort of two sides to this. One is like, I don't want somebody to steal my sensitive documents, so I'm going to put like salaries2016.pdf up on this file share of secret documents, and nobody should ever open this, but... If it does get opened, then you know, alert me at this URL. The other side is, um, let's say that you're a fascist government and you want to keep people from whistleblowing. Um, you could use these techniques, in theory, to prevent people from being able to do that at least easily without being identified. Um, you can imagine that you know, somebody exfiltrates a, a document that is of value to be put in the public knowledge. And um, the document calls home from every place it's opened, from your computer, your work computer, your home computer, uh, a, a lawyer's office, a friend's home, uh, and then everybody disappears, right? That's, this is, I think, the thing that scares me most about all of this is, is, is this potential misuse. So another that is fairly obvious is de-anonymization. So if you've ever used the Tor browser bundle, raise your hand. Just kidding, don't do that. Don't tell anyone that you've it's used it. It's a bad idea, don't do yeah. it. So if trap. you've ever used the Tor browser bundle and you've ever downloaded a file via the browser, it pops up this great little warning dialog that says, note, if you open this file, it could easily de-anonymize you and tell bad people what your real IP address is. Don't do it. This research is why that warning dialog exists. They know that this stuff is possible, no. And they are trying to warn you. The, 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 to be clear, this, this warning existed before our research, yes. but this, this technique, this, this, type of, this, sort of yeah. I, this sort of idea is why that warning exists. Um, one potential application of this, for instance, a, a, a government agency, you may not have administrative control over that jihadist wiki, and you may not be able to track its users, but let's say you upload a PDF file called How to Make a Bomb in Three Easy Steps, and it has a remote image URL embedded in it, so that everyone that opens that PDF file, you now know who they are and that they want to make a bomb in three easy steps. So we, we discussed this pretty, uh, or at least we showed this and uh, focused on this fairly extensively just because, you know, if you can take over somebody's machine, if you can get somebody's credentials, then there's a lot more that you can do. Um, but you know, this is, I think, a, a pretty important part of this is that you, you can actually affect the security of a machine. You can get credentials and, and pass them along or, or crack them. Um, 
just in case somebody, it, there's somebody in the audience who's not quite familiar with NTLM relaying attacks, I'm going to go over it very briefly. Um, so normal NTM, uh, NTLM authentication, uh, at least version 2, um, you, as a client, say to a server, hey, I'd like to authenticate um, and get access to whatever it is you've got there. And the server says, okay, here's this number. I need you to mix this in cryptographically with your password hash and send that back. And the client does so, <clears throat> returns that value to the server, which then decides based on does this match up with the information they have, should this person be allowed access? Now, the problem here is that while the client is authenticated, the server is not. So there's nothing that uh, there's nothing in this uh, negotiation that ties all this data to a particular server, except the nonce, uh, that that random number. So if, as an attacker, you can get a client to attempt to authenticate to you, you can just pass that information along until you get to the point where you gain access and you tell the client, "No, sorry, that didn't work. Would you like to try again?" And then you pass it to somewhere else. So um, we, we, in our demo, we had a password that was easily cracked. It was like, you know, two seconds, uh, if that. Um, this is an alternative to that where you pass the credentials along without having to crack them. So anything that they, the person attempting to authenticate to you, knowingly or not, uh, is trying to gain access, uh, whatever they can gain access to with their credentials, you can now gain access to because of the way that NTLM works. It's worth noting that as of the most recent, or actually it's been quite a while back that they've patched this, it is no longer possible to relay authentication back to the same machine that, that initiated it. Hilariously, before yes. I think Windows 2000 or maybe XP, you could have someone attempt to authenticate with you, pass the exact same authentication information back to their machine, and authenticate to them. So that's been fixed. For a long time now. Um, so we, we discussed briefly um, the, uh, the fact that you're sending um, with these documents when you're initiating outbound requests, it's coming from a pri privileged network position. You're behind that, you're behind whatever firewall might be in place. Um, and you can exploit all sorts of interesting things that um, you know maybe assume that if you're on the local network, you're totally fine. Um, so. Um, this, this slide probably could be renamed, so uh, CSERF assumes some sort of authentication, authenticated session that you're riding on. In some cases, that, that, that is absolutely the case. Uh, as you saw in previous demonstrations, uh, several of these techniques, um, these formats, uh, the parsers will actually just pop, pop open the default browser um, and, and work from there. Um, if you can do that, then you can ride on authenticated sessions uh, that might exist with the default browser. Um, but even without that, you're still coming from a, a, probably a privileged network position when somebody's opening a document. So we've told you what the problem is. We've told you how it can be abused. Let's talk a little bit about what we thought about how to fix it. Possible mitigations, because there really isn't a silver bullet. There isn't a perfect solution to this, but we're going to go over what we thought of and why it's not necessarily a great solution. The first and perhaps most obvious is antivirus. All of the techniques that we're using have fairly standard signatures, so if I bug an RTF file, it is possible for a program to analyze that RTF file and tell that it's been bugged. Unfortunately, there are so many formats that this is possible for. We really only scratch the surface. There is no way that AV can reliably cover every format that has the ability to be bugged. Additionally, some of the techniques that we've used have legitimate use cases. There may be a legitimate reason to embed a remote image in a PDF, or for instance, a playlist file. There are legitimate reasons for a playlist file to have remote file URLs in it, otherwise it would be kind of a boring playlist, I guess. So these, both of these issues are things that prevent AV from being an effective mitigation. Um, let's talk about format changes. So some of these formats, they're not necessarily legitimate use cases for opening these types of URLs, so we'll just change the format to prevent that. Unfortunately, time and time again in our industry, it's been proven that that's just not possible. You have to maintain a certain level of backwards compatibility. There are too many people using these formats, too many people using these parsers, and too many files that have been created with older versions for us to be able to change the format. There's just too much inertia behind how these things are already designed. Finally, in my opinion, the best mitigation that we've come up with yet, application-level firewalls. 
Um, these are things like on Windows, Zone Alarm, or on OS X, Little Snitch, or on Linux, um, is it Lotus Flower? Leopard Flower. Leopard Flower. So what these do is every time an application attempts to initiate a connection, this firewall will notify you and say, hey, your PDF reader is trying to connect to attacker.com. Do you want to allow this? This is a pretty good mitigation for the vast majority of file formats. For instance, it, it, it will never be the case that I want WordPad to connect to a remote server. So I can say deny, deny, deny if my WordPad is trying to connect to a remote server. However, for playlist formats like M3U, that's kind of the whole point is that they connect to remote servers. So you can't reliably say application firewall fixes everything and is a panacea. Yeah, the, the, the reason that we're talking about like all these different mitigations and how they do or don't work to various degrees is because honestly, we, we don't have a, a good solution for this. We don't, we don't have a, a, a fix. Um, we're just kind of trying to like put more fuel on the fire. Um, so another thing we talked, we, we thought about is warnings and, and this goes, you know, uh, the, obviously there's some use to warnings and, and some people will click through, but you'll at least uh, put, be putting more information in the hands of the user. Um, Obviously, people click through warnings a lot of the time, so this is not necessarily helpful at all. Um, but it might at least get you to stop and say, oh, well, hold on, maybe this is not something I want to do. So you're at least putting more power to the user. Um, you could also do something to just shut off networking capabilities for particular programs in general. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Damon made the uh, example that with WordPad, you, I, I, mean, I personally, and Damon apparently personally, don't want WordPad to ever communicate with the internet, except maybe like if it has to communicate to softwareupdate.microsoft.com, but that's done through the OS, so just never, just never at all. Um, so for something like that, it's easy, but it's, it has the same problems as application level firewalls. The other thing is attempting to hook network calls in some programs is a lot cleaner than in others. Um, certain things, proxy chains will just completely break because, uh, was it Chrome? Yeah. yeah. Chrome disables the LD preload directive, so you can't use proxy chains against Chrome, at least the last time I tried it. Um, there's also egress filtering. This is a good, uh, this is a good partial solution, and this will at least prevent things like, um, outbound SMB traffic leaving your organization or your home. You know, this is something that's a, a good idea in general, is doing egress filtering. Uh, but again, you still need to let some things through, so you might be letting, you know, web traffic through, and that's a, uh, the way that a lot of the, the privacy violating tracking stuff, uh, we were able to do that. So, you think this stuff is cool, and you want to play with it yourself and get your hands dirty. We have exactly what you want. We have created a tool that accepts as input all of the various formats that we support and will produce as output a bugged version of that same file. It's still a work in progress. It's like version 000 negative one alpha. Um, additionally, it's not yet on GitHub I think because we two, are, have been really actually. drunk this entire week and we haven't had good internet connectivity. So it will be on GitHub within the next one to two weeks if you want to download this thing and start bugging your own files. So um, at this point, um, we're going to open it up for questions. Okay, I'm a round of applause. Time for some questions. Anybody? Over there on the mic, I see someone. Hi, great talk. Um, did Thanks. you guys find any issues with default file handlers? So when, uh, when Windows gives a preview or when OS X gives a preview of the files, did you find that would also initiate connections to wherever. So um, the question uh, that the, the question is, did default file handling rules uh, prove to be any uh, effective measure against this or did they get in our way of doing this sort of thing or was that, was that, is that, am I understanding you right? Either or really. Um, when you open, uh, when you click on a file but don't open the file in Windows Explorer for example, you can have it preview the file without actually opening a full version of word.exe gotcha. or whatever. So, so are you asking if the, the preview is also vulnerable to this sort of thing? Yeah. 
Uh, that's not something we've tested. Uh, I can imagine for certain vectors, it I would could certainly be. postulate like SVG files. It would be very likely that that would be vulnerable because you can't properly display the image without right. downloading the style sheets. So I would say it probably varies by format, and I would say we sure. can't say authoritatively whether or not that's the case. Yeah, we can we can say with some some certainty that cert, uh, some of them are are likely to work even with preview. So anything that you have to visually render, probably it will work. Uh, Anything like a, so, like a video file where five seconds in it, it you know launches a, a URL. That's almost certainly not going to work. I I can say pretty certain, pretty certainly that that's not going to work. But as previously stated, we haven't tested it, so we can't say for Try sure. Try it out on your own another. once we get the tool online. I will. Thanks. Cheers. Any other questions, or did we just cover it so well that nobody has any uncertainty left in their hearts? I yes. guess so. <laughs> um, yes, let's yes. bring it back one slide to the GitHub URL. Go ahead and copy it down. Um, we super duper dark promise that it will be there in one to two weeks. We have a somewhat working version on our laptops, but we have not yet found the person within NCC group that knows how to put things in this URL. But we will find that person in one to two weeks, and then it will be there. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Damon, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you all for listening.